and discussion last Tuesday on different kinds of behaviors. In particular, remember, we went through kind of increasing dimension, one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, at each point asking what kinds of behavior can you get. Fixed points only in one dimension, fixed points on limit cycles in two dimension, and then all hell breaks loose in three dimensions because we have two more things, these torus attractors and chaotic attractors. And I ended with some static pictures of the uh, Lorenz and Rustler solution sets. Well, and I very quickly kind of waved my hands about how we should think about the shape of them. So I want to show you, and, and I'll be doing this pretty regularly in the lectures, some, some uh, interactive uh, demos to, to help uh, develop our visual intuition. Um, Okay, so in this sort of looking at the screen, I can I'll try to show you what I'm doing here. I'm quite fit. One of the problems with the some of the graph, graphics we generate, right? We have these nice high resolution desktops, but old video projectors that do very coarse resolution. So I'm a little bit dubious about how this is going to come across at, at Berkeley and through the camcorder. So um, if it's not too convincing, it's too washed out, I might be able to make some movies and then add those back into the online video. Of course, this requires becoming a better video editor than I currently am. Anyway, so, so what I have here is a terminal window and then a display window. And uh, the display window will have um, the solutions of these two different sets of differential equations. So the first one I'm going to look at is our favorite, the Lorenz. Standard values, setting parameter values. I'm going to keep the time step the same, and then just pick some short. We're going to look at this in three dimensions. They're different. This program lets you do uh, different kinds of projections. There we go. Now, I, now I'm going to pre increase the solution. Okay, so what you should be seeing, and, and kind of, I'll be explicit in my descriptions so that you know what you're missing in Berkeley. So we have two axes here. They're blue, maybe a little too thin, and over here, a little cycle. I just integrated the equation for a little bit. But now I'm going to cre increase the number of steps from just a, a, a few dozen to uh, 5,000 steps. And then what we'll see is... Now, the sort of yellow, brownish, single solution. Now, there's a problem here, right? The machines are so fast, it just sort of threw this up here. So, it didn't give you any sense of what was going on. What was going on is I put in an initial condition, and the numerical integrator calculated next states and then it plotted this out. So, you didn't get to see that. Um, I should put in some speed control so we can see it going slowly. But take my word for it, this is a single solution starting from one initial condition. And then it traces out this very complicated looking set, complicated trajectory or orbit. And the question is, what's going on? So what I want to do now is um, kind of fly around a little bit to give you some sense that these complicated solutions have well, they're not a complete tangle of yarn. There's a certain amount of geometry to them. And to a large extent, what we're trying to do is understand this geometry, this sort of emergent larger shape. Right? The differential equations just say, if I'm in this state, go to this next state. When we look at the solution set, this is really a much larger scale geometry that's emerged from following these local rules. And this larger scale geometry isn't, it's determined by the differential equations, of course, but you can't read it off of these local rule specifications, which are the differential equations. Okay. So, um, so now I've got to rotate the axes around here at about the, the canonical position. And then Rotate about the z-axis. So hopefully, as soon as I start doing this, our visual perception immediately starts to give us a sense of an object that has some geometry to it. Oops. 
Is this coming through on the video at all, Wayne? Up here it is. Okay. Yeah, it looks pretty good actually. Oh, great. When you zoom in. Oh, that's good. So we can even kind of move around faster. Kind of depends on. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Well, if I go over to this perspective, it's pretty thin. So those big ears look like they're sort of sheet like. If I look at this way, that was the picture I showed on uh, the last lecture. So, so the way you should be thinking about this is that out here, we have these sort of flat sheets of parallel trajectories, and then they sort of meet somehow, somewhere along the z-axis. There's some two sheets. Imagine if, if, if these trajectories here were, say, out, coming out in the positive uh, direction from the screen, then the other side, imagine that that sheet is behind the screen, and somehow they get sutured together down here. So that's sort of the goal. What is this, what I call last time, the branched manifold, the sort of approximate manifold of this? And you can start to get some sense, when you look at the side, how these things sort of come in down here, and they don't meet till sort of low z values near the origin. And I can also rotate it around this way. Now maybe this, you start to get some sense of how they suture together. Now, I have to say one thing. I'm driving, right? So, and there's an extra level of um, feedback I get as I'm doing this that makes the visual object clear. So we're, we'll try to put up um, some 3D uh, solvers and, and 3D displayers within the Sage notebook. There's a little bit of security issue with the Java system, but we'll do our best. So you, so you can also drive around. It's no better way to learn about these things than to look at it yourself. I mean, you're getting most of the correct, you know, the, the visual impressions here, but it's much better to, that you do the interaction. So you can kind of see. Let's take this around. Hey, Jim, can I ask another question? Yeah. It seems like on this system, it's spending. Uh, the states are spending more time in the right hand side at the moment, the way you've got it sort of pictured. Is that because of an initial condition, or if, if you ran this for many initial conditions, would that still be true? Or as you trace time to infinity, do you think it would spend equal amount right. of time in each sort of part of that? Uh, right, okay, so Chris's question was, it seems like it's spending sort of more time over here than here. And is that just due to a particular initial condition and solution, or uh, would that balance out if I looked at a longer trajectory? So if you remember, when, the, when I first introduced the equations at the bottom, I noted that there was a symmetry in the equations that you can check. If x goes to minus x and y goes to minus y, that symmetry in x and y means that the, the distribution will have to be uniform. So if there's any variation from uniform distribution, it's due to the particular initial condition and how long they ran. So in fact, if you let it go for a longer period of time, uh, it'll, it'll fill out. It's like, as well just do that. Right. Yeah. So it looks like it spent more time over here. You can kind of see what's going on. What happens is, and it's more discussion of the geometry, so you have to develop some visual intuition here. If I come down along the z-axis here and I go way, so following longer and longer, eventually I, I deviate and start going off on positive x or y. I go way, way out, and that injects me very close in to this. It's called elliptic fixed point over here. It's mostly circular. It has complex eigenvalues around here. So what happened here, in fact, it may have been where I started it off, it spent a lot of time just spiraling out like this. So it looks like it spent a lot of time here. And I can just change that. Uh, let's see. Let's, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do another 5,000 steps. So we can see what it looks like. So the first thing, we'll just overlay it so you can sort of see it's maybe a little more balanced. Now I'm going to clear the previous 5,000 steps. And you can see it's a little more balanced here. Or, I can, why not, let's do, <laughs> let's do uh, 50,000 steps. There. So, so if, you, if you run it long enough, almost almost a uniform density across the sheets, wherever you are. Now, there are two sheets here, so in the projection, it looked like it's a little more probable, but it's not. So, so the, uh, 
the density there is almost uniform. Kind of tails off a little bit near the center, with, near, near the inside of one of these racetracks, and near the outside. But it's pretty much uniform. And we'll study this in detail more. Um, how we can understand the, the probability distribution that's produced by these trajectories. And that's one of the main questions. Here I am talking about probability distributions, the likelihood I'm going to be here, here, here in the attractor. But I gave you the deterministic differential equations. So how did determinism lead to apparent randomness? That's one of the main themes here. Well, this is a classic example. So we've already seen what's going on, but we want to understand this in some more detail. But how do we understand it? The distribution gets produced by a single trajectory. Okay, so um, let's go do the same thing for the Rustler. And the parallel values don't change the time step. We'll look at it in three dimensions again. Um, okay, so this is. The Rustler, we're actually looking edge on, so this is the xy plane here, and then this is the z axis. So what's happening actually is a large part of the, the attractor almost can't see because it's actually right exactly in the xy plane. Let me show that to you. See? So it's rotating around the z axis like this, mostly flat in the xy plane, and then when it gets to this one quadrant over here, what happens is that the z coordinate goes unstable. So if I remember the z dot equation was z dot is equal to some constant b plus some constant control parameter c times x, sorry, z times the quantity uh, x minus c, which is a control parameter. What happens, x is changing sign, which is turning the z equation stable or unstable, exponentially stable or unstable. So it's stable over here because of the x values. And then this one quadrant, it goes unstable. But the whole time it's going unstable, it's also rotating around and eventually shuts itself down again. So you can kind of convince yourself a little bit by looking at the equations that at least what we're seeing here in the solution set structure is consistent with that. It's not something you can sort of directly derive and would have this shape. But this was sort of shape that Otto Rissler is trying to go for in his personal uh, strange attractor design methodology. So, so we can also rotate about the z-axis to get some sense of what's going on here. A very flat in xy. Um, <coughs> In fact, there's a certain amount of ambiguity. Right. So, so the way we're going to think about this, and we'll come back to study the, the geometry of describe this quote branch manifold. We have this flat racetrack, and then it goes unstable, the z-coordinate, and then folds back onto itself. So you kind of imagine this rubber sheet geometry. The sheet, if, if you were flying along inside the sheet and you looked at your neighbors, what you'd see is everyone is moving away from you. Remember, that was sort of the goal. We want recurrent instability. So everywhere in the sheet, every, the, your, your neighboring trajectories are all moving away from you. You start at some point and you do some little perturbation, so those neighboring trajectories, those are always moving away from us. But this is supposed to be stable and recurrent, so we need, it's not just a flow that goes off to infinity, we have to somehow have it fold back onto itself and reconnect. So this is constantly happening. So this is interesting local instability, separation, small little variations getting amplified. And this is global geometry, which keeps it compact. Right? If we start out in, in far away from the origin in the three-dimensional flow, all the arrows are pointing in. So from you know, for some distance, this little attractor down in the origin looks like a fixed point. So the flow comes in, but once we get down here, we see that it's kind of Stable on the outside, but within it is constant recurrent. States are making close passes by each other, and then neighboring perturbations are always being amplified. Okay, just to give us a little taste. So, so the, the shifting gears, though, what we're going to do is um, 
in this survey, the main ideas of dynamical systems is I want to talk about how these behaviors change as a function of the control parameters. So this is the area of bifurcation theory. So what we've done so far is just focus in some way on uh, single dynamical systems, certain kinds of invariant sets, fixed point limit cycles, quasi-periodic attractors, chaotic attractors. And now I want to ask how do those change in fact, how does the whole attractor basin portrait change as I vary some parameter that modifies the vector field? You can think of this like experimental controls. I have some fluid and uh, temperature difference across the fluid layer. I have convection uh, rolls, and then they might go unstable. So think about these various coefficients uh, in, say, for example, like the Russell, you had A, B, and C. Those are controls. We ask how this behavior changes. So last time I was, we were thinking about, I'm going to give you a dynamical system and you wanted the big picture, the attractor basin portrait. So today we're going to talk about the big, big picture. How are we going to think in the style of qualitative dynamics about how system behaviors can change as we modify, as we change some control parameter. So we're going to kind of up the level of abstraction and then we'll come back to some examples. But here's the main idea. I want you to think of, it's purely formal. Why don't you think about the space of all dynamical systems? So fix the dimension. Say we're thinking about three-dimensional systems just like the Muslim Lorenz. So you, and they're all specified either by maybe some equations or in the general case just vector fields. So now I want you to think. When I say the space of all dynamical systems over a three-dimensional state space, you're supposed to imagine space of all vector fields I can put down. Okay, so here's my artist conception because that's not really something you visualize, right? That would be an infinite dimensional space. I could put arrows in any, any possible way at every point in three dimensional space. But just kind of abstractly, this cube here is a space of all vector fields and a point is going to be a particular vector field or a particular dynamical system. Okay. So how are we going to imagine changing control parameters? Well, say I'm varying the A, B, or C parameter in the in Bristler system, we're going to imagine that we have our dynamical system and then there's some sort of formal control parameter here. Imagine it's just some real number like A, B, or C in the Bristler system. And so in, 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 as I slowly vary that control parameter, the picture we have of what's going on in the space of all vector fields, the space of all dynamical systems, is that we're tracing out a one parameter family of dynamical systems. Okay, so it's just an arc in this space. And we're interested, as we change this parameter, in how behavior gets modified. So this is the arena of bifurcation theory. So what we're going to say is that as we vary this parameter along this arc, if behavior changes qualitatively, we're going to say that there's a bifurcation. So say on this side, I have a single fixed point, and on this I have two fixed points. There's no way for me to sort of rubber sheet distort the state space to change that number. Now maybe, sort of before this bifurcation happens and I'm varying the control parameter view, maybe the fixed point is moving around. But I'm allowed, under this notion of qualitative equivalence, to do a rubber sheet distortion. But as soon as I change the number of fixed points, or the fixed point turns into a limit sign, if there's a qualitative change, and those behaviors can't be mapped into each other, then we say at that parameter value mu, or that change occurs, we've had a bifurcation. So the definition of bifurcation is, is a qualitative change of behavior as you slowly vary a parameter. Now the caveat here on slow, it's a little bit familiar, people have studied physics, we have words like adiabatic and quasi-static change of parameters. In thermodynamics, meaning we always kind of stay in equilibrium, it's kind of the same notion here. If I vary the parameter too fast, I'm actually adding some dynamics to the system. So here, when we're talking about bifurcations, the variation of the control parameter is just arbitrarily slow. 
So we're always seeing uh, a single dynamic system. It's not remembering it's a previous uh, uh, setting, previous behavior state. And then, uh, so, so now, the, the, so the, one of the main questions in bifurcation theory is can we, is, is there some organization in the space of dynamical systems to where these bifurcations can occur? So what I've kind of done here is this light blue sort of to indicate the kind of sheet. And you can kind of imagine that even if I changed the, how I varied the parameter and went through and punctured the sheet different ways, I'd still have the same bifurcation that I want. So the question is, is there some way of classifying how these bifurcations can occur? What kind of bifurcations are there? And then how does that organize the space of all dynamic systems? You know, maybe somewhat surprising, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. There's actually quite a bit of structure. So not only are individual dynamical systems structured in terms of invariant sets and how those are stable or unstable, tractor based and portraits, separate matrices based on the attraction, but even at the level of how they can change in behavior, there are a number of constraints. And so we'll be able to classify how behaviors can change. Okay, so that's that's the sort of the very general motivation picture behind this. And so what I want to do is go through some one-dimensional examples uh, to give you a kind of a flavor of the kinds of qualitative analyses you can do <clears throat> that give you some sense of possible changes in behavior. And so today we're going to focus on just equilibrium fixed points. Next lecture, we'll talk about how time-dependent behaviors, fixed points go into limit cycles, how limit cycles can change limit cycles, and how limit cycles can become chaotic. Today, just to get started, mostly to help visual intuition, we're going to just look at how fixed points can change their stability. And number. Okay, so three kind of classic simple examples. So the first one is called the saddle node bifurcation scheme, or more picturesquely, the blue sky catastrophe. The notion of catastrophe will be why that's used to become clear, including why blue skies. Now, in, in the theory of, of bifurcations, there are sort of prototype differential equations that sort of encapsulate these different kinds of bifurcations. And in the terminology of the area, those are called normal forms. You can sort of show if, I, if the system is going through one of these so-called saddle node bifurcations, this very simple one-dimensional differential equation captures all of the essential features. And this is simple. It's just x dot is equal to r minus x squared, so just a constant minus x squared. And it's set up so that the bifurcation occurs when r goes to 0. So let's do the same kind of plot we've done in a couple lectures already. So when r is negative, just look up here. Well, x squared is always positive, therefore negative x squared is always negative. If r is negative, everything is negative. Therefore, the vector is always pointing to negative x, right? X dot is negative, therefore the vector field points down this way. So again, I'm plotting state space, one-dimensional state space, and then basically f of x on the right-hand side, or x dot this way. So we have a parabola here that's just offset by a constant control parameter. So it's just, in the general case, looks like this. So the green here is just f of x, the right-hand side, and it's below x dot equal to zero. That means that each value here says that's the strength of the vector, and it's always negative, so it's always pointing this way. So wherever you start, you're going to go off to minus infinity. Okay. So then, we take x right up to x, x or r right up to 0. What happens, that's, of course, changing this par the parabola's offset, and it finally exactly touches x dot is equal to 0, which is where you have a fixed point. So this is the birth of a fixed point. No fixed points here, right? No matter where you start, you're going to go off to minus infinity, nothing. But here, right, right equal to zero, we get a fixed point. And in fact, you can kind of tell from this, again, the green part of the function is always negative. So what we get for this fixed point is mixed stability. If I start on the right side, positive x, it's going to come down and stop. If I'm an x zero, x dot equal to zero, I will sit there. If I perturb just a little bit off and started at negative x, it's going to flow off this way. So things kind of flow in and stop at the origin, or if you start negatively, they flow up this way. Okay, so neutral stability. Okay, so now let's increase r to be positive. And what happens is this quadratic function punctures through the x-axis. Now we have a portion of f of x, the vector field, right-hand side is positive, which means the arrows are pointing this way. 
But you can kind of see what happened. Right? Now I have two places where x dots equal to zero. One, again, again graphically, you can appreciate that. It's a fixed point, but it's unstable. I start over here, I flow away from it, I start negative, I flow away, but this one is stable. So it kind of came across, there was this one particular R value, R equals zero, where we first got a fixed point, was mixed stability, in some sense that mixed stability kind of split, and we had the birth of two separate fixed points, one unstable and one stable. Okay, so now, that, that, these, are kind of like, these are snapshots of the state space, the vector field, at different particular R values. But we're trying to think about what's the structure in the space of all dynamical systems. So that brings us to what's called a bifurcation diagram. So we kind of step back, and what we're going to do is just plot the fixed points, not the whole vector field, but just the fixed points, as a function of the control parameter. Right? So here is my state space, and it's one dimensional. And then here's R. So generally, a bifurcation diagram is we plot the attractors and repellers as a function of control parameter. And what we get here is, well, remember, if r is negative, there's nothing. We just flow up. There's nothing to plot here. Right at r equal to zero, the origin is marginally stable, half stable, half unstable. And then we get this splitting off of a stable fixed point, which I draw with a solid line, and an unstable fixed point with a dashed line. So that's why it's called a blue sky catastrophe. In fact, if you had a complicated set of equations and you were varying some parameter, oh, there are no fixed points. And all of a sudden, boom, this just appears out of nowhere. In fact, because the equations are so simple, remember, x dot is equal to r minus x squared. We're plotting where x dot is equal to zero, so I can solve for x star, the fixed point, as a function of r. Well, it's a square root of r. So I put down here, we have two branches. Right. Right. Just looking at this equation, setting this equal to zero, I can solve the x values that make that zero. And so I plot it now as a function of r. That's why we know it has that kind of parabolic shape. So no fixed points, not two fixed points. So one interesting thing about this class of bifurcations is that we can think about the fixed points and their stability as if these are charged particles. And when you go through one of these bifurcations, charge is conserved. And this is just a little bit of a kind of helpful fiction, right? So when R is negative, what's the charge? It was zero. There's nothing there. R is positive. What's the charge? But we have a stable fixed point, a stable fixed point. Charge of one, charge of minus one, total charge is zero. So these are kind of, kind of local bifurcations. We're sort of looking at small values of R right around where the bifurcation is. Okay, so sound and load bifurcation, kind of the first one. The next kind of bifurcation is called transcritical bifurcation, or, or prosy way, exchange of stability. And we'll see why when we do the bifurcation diagram when that's the case. The normal form for this bifurcation is actually not so different. X dot is equal to R times X minus X squared. So all I did is add an X right next to the R. Um, now, looking at the right-hand side, we know that for all R values, since X occurs in both terms, that the origin is going to be a fixed point. X equals zero, X dot sounds going to be zero. So that's always going to be there. Now, graphically, what's going on, and it's a little more uh, work to think about why. So, so when, when R is negative, well, at all R values, the origin is going to be a fixed point. So we know whatever this function is here, it's got to pass through the origin. So, so when R is negative, what happens is that uh, there's a small segment in here, just below uh, uh, the origin, where the vector field is positive. Right? There'll be so so here. This is the negative x-axis. R is negative, so r times x is positive. And if I'm sufficiently close to the origin, x squared will be small, so this first term will dominate and be positive. So I know that there's some part of the vector field, the right-hand side is positive, and the vector field is pointing this way. So I have this pair of fixed points, one at the origin. This one is stable by this analysis. Slow connected. Talked about it last time. And there's another one over here, of course, where it's unstable. Then, when r is equal to zero, we're actually sort of back in the same situation 
we were with the Saturn node, except for passing through spatial dynamics. This is a slightly different arc. And then when R goes positive, we have the mirror symmetric situation. We can actually tell that this function has that symmetry. So we, as soon as we've analyzed this, we know that the, the exactly complementary picture is going to happen over here. We have now the origin has gone unstable, and then we have a positive, uh, a stable fixed point of positive. Okay, so any guesses as to what the bifurcation diagram is going to look like? Right, remember that's plotting these fixed points. Now we have two, except for this one degenerate case at the bifurcation. We have one fixed point there. So you have two fixed points, one fixed point, two fixed points. We actually have to solve this guy for x dot is equal to zero. We want to solve for x star as a function of r to get it. And well, we already know one solution, x is equal to zero. That's always got to be there. But what happens is this. So here's the origin, x equals zero. It's always there. It's always a fixed point, except here it's stable. Above r equals zero, it's unstable, dashed line. And then we have this other fixed point sort of coming in from negative x. It's almost like a particle interaction. It kind of collides with the... the the, the stable fixed point coming in, and then it goes off and becomes a stable fixed point. And they're both just linear functions. Why are they linear functions? Well, x dot equal to zero, I already know one of the solutions, x equal to zero, I factor that out, and then I just have to find out where r is equal to x. Okay. So that describes this other thing coming in. And then the, you know, the description is exchange of stability. It's as if this fixed point and uh, coming in from negative x and the one at the origin, they kind of continue on through each other, but they've exchanged their stabilities. And notice again that this sort of fake, what's called topological charge, is zero for every bar. Right? One fixed point that's stable, one that's unstable, is sum up to zero for all R. Okay, so these are pretty easy to analyze, just one-dimensional differential equations. Uh, now, so the final one-dimensional example will be it's called the pitchfork bifurcation. And we're going to see lots of examples of this, well, in the saddle book, too, uh, later on. Uh, it's normal form. Again, it's not that different. It's pretty similar to the, to the uh, exchange of stability bifurcation, except instead of x squared and x cubed. Okay, so now we've got this cubic function. And what does it look like? So for a negative r, uh, well, again, same argument. Notice x occurs in both terms. Therefore, the origin will always set x dot equal to 0. So it's, this function has to pass through the origin no matter the r, what the r value is. But then we have this, this cubic function here that you know, for negative r and negative x, it becomes positive. Right? So x is negative, you cube it, that's a positive. That's a negative number, but it's minus sign, so that's positive. And then x is negative and r is negative, so this is all positive. So this is always positive over here when r is negative. Uh, when r is equal to zero, we just have pure cubic going through the origin. And then the interesting thing, of course, when r is goes, goes positive, one way to think about this is close to the origin, right, the x cubed term is going to be small, and we just have this linear function dominating the vector field. So we have that linear part of that on the right hand side. And eventually, far enough away, x cubed starts to dominate, and then it pulls the, that, that linear function around the origin off to negative x dot and positive x dot. So here we're going from one stable fixed point to three fixed points. Two stable, one unstable. And here's the bifurcation that we Negative r just had that, just the origin, and it was stable. The function just passed through negative slope of the origin. Then right here we have this birth of three fixed points. The origin loses its stability. And we have two branches coming off. Two, two stable fixed points. And again, they have this 
the, the two roots of solving for a fixed point of the dependent square root on R. Okay, so these these are very common applications. In fact, when you start playing around with solving some of these differential equations, especially <coughs> around where they're chaotic, you can change a parameter value. You see periodic orbits appear and fixed points appear. Some abandon and they'll find these kinds of bifurcations. They're pretty common. Now we know sort of how to analyze them, at least around parameter values close to where the bifurcation occurs. Now it might help a little bit, and this will uh, make uh, a little bit of a connection back to some physics, although this is not a second order system, it's just first order differential equation. But we can think of uh, these one dimensional differential equations sometimes in terms of a particle evolving in a potential. Well, technically, this is a particle moving in molasses <laughs> in a potential. So, so if I write down my differential equation, x dot is equal to little f of x, sometimes I can rewrite that f of x as the derivative of a potential function v. Or the other way to say this is this d of x is simply the integral of f of x. Now, why do I mention it? Well, in the case of this pitchfork bifurcation, I have this rx minus x cubed. When I integrate that, I get an x squared term and an x to the fourth term. At least that looks like some kind of superharmonic potential. Again, this isn't a second order system, but you can think about it that way. And this sort of second quadratic potential well is playing off against a fourth order potential well. And as a function of r, it's going to change side, dominate or not dominate. So the potential well interpretation of this pitchfork bifurcation is following. And maybe it's a little more intuitive. So for r negative, I had just a pure. Uh, convex, upwards convex potential, and if I imagine this you know, particle rolling down very slowly, it's in molasses, there's no second order term, no, 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 no x double dot here, it would eventually settle down here and stop, and that would be the fixed point. Write it, or equal to zero, well that turns off the quadratic term. So this is just x to the fourth, it's a very, very flat potential, you could kind of imagine the ball comes down here, kind of rolls around a little bit, it's so, so flat. But then, when r is positive, what happens is this, this square potential now turns over, it's unstable. So near the origin, right, the x with fourth term goes away, we just have this, but now it's negative. Far enough away that x with fourth dominates and the potential increases again, so we get two potential wells. So an unstable maximum of the origin, and then two stable minima that correspond to the fixed Okay, sometimes that's, that's helpful to think about this pitchfork application. It's you know, very common. Let's we'll study this uh, in some detail. Um, we talk about cascades of bifurcations. So this has all been sort of local, small values of the parameter right around where the bifurcation occurs. And the fixed points vary continuously with that small variation. Now, other more interesting things can happen. And that takes us to what are called catastrophes. Um, so we're still talking about how fixed points can change the fixed points. But with catastrophes, what happens is that fixed points can just disappear and they can the system will just hop to one very, very far away. Not that there's some small you know, square root dependence closeness notion. There can be huge changes in suddenly as you vary slowly vary a parameter. So this sort of popularized in the 60s. The French mathematician René Combs called it catastrophe theory, and it's sort of a model of sudden change. Even though I am only slowly changing the control parameters on my experiment, there's nothing that I'm doing that's going to cause it, but suddenly, boom, the <coughs> that you were at just disappears and the system flops into some completely different attractor. Which idea is finally taking hold in the world of climate change? So this might come off as of just a mathematical analysis, but some of these paradigms of change inform how we think about climate change and the weather and so on. Um, 
this notion that the equilibria change only slowly as we change the control parameter. That, that corresponds to these pictures we've all seen of mean temperature change between you know, 1900 and the year 2100. And we dump in more carbon, and there's this proportionate change, 2, 3, 4, 5 degrees C as we go further out. And the big air bars there. Could happen that way, but actually the weather, it's hydrodynamics, at least it's more than hydrodynamics, it's at least hydrodynamics. It's a very nonlinear system we can have some of these catastrophic changes. Just because I'm slowly adding, dumping more and more CO2 in the atmosphere, you can have these sudden climate shifts, is the idea. Sudden climate change. Suddenly, other mechanisms come in, get activated, that change the available equilibrium. This, to me, is the most frightening thing, because we don't know what can happen. The weather system is extremely high dimensional, not like these very low dimensional systems where we're going to classify what can happen. But even here, we can see that there can be these sudden changes. So, so I'll go through just one example of this, how it works. And it's actually going to lead us to think a little bit about um, doing some computing with nonlinear systems. Okay. So, what I'm going to do here, and this is just, what, uh, just one example of the cusp catastrophe. And uh, it starts off with the Pitchfork bifurcation normal form, Rx minus X cubed, except I'm going to add another control parameter. So this is a catastrophe where I have the R control parameter and then just a constant offset H. Uh, and we can also think of, you know, this actually is being some kind of, some kind of potential here, where in you know, kind of physics terminology, this would be an external field. But the analogy kind of breaks down. It's not that different. Things. Anyway, we already did all this. Right? With h equal to zero, that is the pitchfork bifurcation. So, if we were just looking at the, the, the bifurcation diagram, when we have our pitchfork bifurcation origin goes unstable, and then this square root of r set of fixed point coming off of it. Now, when h isn't equal to zero, when it's positive, what happens is, an appeal to your intuition here, the vector field has a little positive component, so it kind of breaks this three-way intersection so that the fixed point down here at, at, for negative r, it stays on its own branch. And then what's left over is a saddle node bifurcation. And you can go convince yourself that with the arguments we introduced already. If I make h a little bit positive, I can go solve for the x stars that makes x dot equal to zero. You can convince yourself that you have this type of, now I just have the fixed point near the origin, it just shifts a little bit as a function of r. And then, some you know, finite distance away, not arbitrarily, but some finite distance away, a pair of fixed points is gone. Okay, now the exercise here that we have to do is imagine these bifurcation diagrams as a function of h. I'm showing them as a function of r at two different r values, at two different h values. And now I want you to imagine, kind of in the third dimension here, I stack this up. Here's h equals zero. Here's h positive, and you have to imagine this blue lines. They actually form a surface, and the result is this. So what I'm showing you here is, first of all, this is the control space. I'm the experimenter. I get to choose r value and h value. And then in this third axis, I'm plotting where the fixed points can be. Okay, so now as a function of r, if I set h equal to zero, which would be this line, I didn't add it in, the plot's going to get kind of busy. That corresponds up here to having a single fixed point, and then you have to kind of imagine the way I draw this curvy surface that two branches, stable branches, come off of it. And then there's an intermediate sheet that's unstable. <coughs> Right, so if I took a vertical slice, I get, we have trouble here with artist, my artist conception, but if I took a vertical slice, or I get h equals zero, and I looked at the intersection of that vertical slice and the blue surface, we call the behavior surface, that would be exactly the pitchfork bifurcation. Then that positive h value I set before, that was, remember, if I was increasing r, oh, there's just a little bit of shift of, of, the, of the position of the fixed point at the origin, and then down below, there's a slice here that cuts through here. I would have an unstable and a stable branch, a saddle of bifurcation. 
Okay, so you have to ponder this a little bit. But so the vertical slices were before the kind of bifurcation we're dealing with. Now we want to think of that as a surface. Or just to say, you know, more directly, over the control space, we have down two-dimensional control space. I want to plot all possible fixed points, stable and unstable. And for that plus catastrophe, one-dimensional differential equation, this is the shape of object you get for where the fixed points can be. These upper and lower surfaces are stable, and the intermediate ones are unstable. So these correspond to, say, minima of the potential or stable fixed points, and then right along the x-axis, we've gone from stable fixed point of the origin to an unstable fixed point of the origin. With the maximum of potential. Of potential. What that means is, again, I'm just kind of reinforcing the geometry you should see in this cartoon picture. Around, so out here, outside this red curve, red area, outside here, like all those are h pairs. If I look up, I'm just going to see one fixed point. And then there's going to be some region inside here where, for those R H values, I look up and there'll be three possible fixed points. Two stable, one unstable. Now, what's, where does this, this boundary come from? It actually is the projection of this edge, just right where the surface folds on itself, right where the surface folds up. That's exactly where the number of equilibria changes. And so I'm plotting here this red curve, cusp against cusp catastrophe. This cusp down in the control space is where the number of solutions changes. And it changes abruptly. So we call this the bifurcation set. So think back to that first picture, kind of abstract picture. We have this question. Space of all dynamical systems, an arc as I vary the parameter, and there's a sort of surface that you go through, and you have a bifurcation. This is kind of the first picture of what you have. I can sort of drive around. I'm the controller. I can, I can drive an R H space, and when I cross this, suddenly I'm going to get three solutions. I go from one solution to three solutions. Okay, let's do that. So, what we're going to do is agree to do an experiment where I, 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 I perform a series of manipulations so that in the control parameter space, I just do a loop, like this. It's a clockwise, if you will. Notice that out here, I have one solution, one solution, one solution, one solution. But right here, it corresponds to being on the upper surface. So if I keep going, that's fine. I still just have one solution, and I don't know that way over there in the state space, something else is going on, the potential for this, these other fixed points that have occurred, because I'm still up here. But notice when I come over to this edge of the bifurcation set, right at that value, Suddenly, I'm at the edge of the surface, and if I if I move R any further, I only now have one stable fixed point I can go to, but that's on the lower branch, the lower part of the surface. So I get this huge jump in equilibrium. So every time I go around here, it's like I go up here. Everything's kind of the fixed point location is slowly changing, slowly changing, and kind of proportional to how I'm varying R and H. And then suddenly I get to here, you know, unbeknownst to me, I, I change RNH by an epsilon, boom, I get this sort of macroscopic movement in the state space to a completely different equilibrium. Well, we can do the, the complementary experiment. I can go around counterclockwise. So I'm traveling up here on the surface again, the fixed point's just changing its position, that's fine, all proportional, until I come along the lower sheet here, and suddenly there's no place for me to go. Right? The, the unstable fixed points, stable fixed points are coming and annihilate each other, and the only place I can go is back up to this upper sheet to the stable fixed point. Again, sort of macroscopic change in equilibrium. So that happens over here in this other branch of the bifurcation surface. For bifurcation surface. So this is interesting. Technologically interesting. Because I have a system whose current stable state depends on the path I took in the control space to get there. That's called hysteresis. And this led to part of the computer revolution. Because this system, I can drive it around and store it in this state or this state, as in the one state or the zero state. 
So this was actually used in the first, and I'm probably dating myself here, in the first magnetic computer memories. They had little magnetic cores, and you could polarize, or you should magnetize the, the core to be clockwise or counterclockwise. And you did that by pulsing currents in different directions to drive it in one state, and once you turn the, the currents off, it was stable and would sit here. And the very distance between these two different stable states was extremely important because you didn't want noise or turning the power on or off or any perturbations to destroy the memory. This is really handy. Back when I first started programming, we had many computers with poor memory, and you could trip over the power cord, plug it back in, and keep computing. Wouldn't lose a beat. Of course, that was the 70s. Then we went through the dynamic memory phrase, which if you turned the power off or lost your battery, you lost everything. Now we're back with solid state memories too. Storing things permanently. Anyway, so this is actually the, the kind of first indication of how nonlinear systems, a real simple system in this case, can store a bit of information. A theme that we keep coming back to. So that's just one example, and it turns out René Tom, the French mathematician in the 60s, and, and, and some Russian colleagues, Soviet colleagues, uh, fleshed out a rather detailed classification scheme. Remember, this is sort of my favorite thing about dynamical systems. And again, without solving in detail these equations, we're starting to get some sense of before it was what kind of behaviors can there be, and now how can those behaviors change? So it's actually a classification scheme. So if we're interested in how equilibria can change into other equilibria, is a classification scheme that goes under the heading of either catastrophe theory or sometimes you'll see it called singularity theory. But anyway, and there's a, this, this table sort of indicates the, some of the results. I won't go in detail into this, but there are whole books on this quite uh, interesting uh, uh, theory to work through. Um, so, so we have a control space and uh, the behavior space. So by controls, uh, we have one control that would be just like R in the three first bifurcation schemes we talked about. The cusp catastrophe has two controls, R and H. And when I'm talking about one behavior, two behaviors, so one behavior, this is the dimension of the uh, state space. So this is one dimensional differential equations here. But there's also a classification scheme for two dimensional dynamical systems, vector fields in 2D. Um, so we went through the fold or satellite bifurcation. One dimension state space, one control, and then we sort of generalize that to the cusp catastrophe, two controls, R and H, and it kind of goes on. And they were not a short on cleverness of names for these different surfaces. Three controls, one dimensional differential equation, we have swallow tail, a butterfly behavior surfaces, and so on. Uh, and two dimensional system, hyperbolic, elliptic, and billic, and parabolic, and billic surfaces, and so on. Quite picturesque. So here's, here's kind of a rogues gallery of some of these things. So the swallowtail catastrophe, again, we have one behavior, so we're just looking at one dimensional differential equation with three controls. Now this might strike the sound as a little bit strange. I mean, here you are in your lab and you've got three controls you're changing. So, so this is, to see this, you have to be manipulating things sort of simultaneously. So it's a little bit uh, maybe um, impractical, but people have found these. Um, so here's the behavior surface and projecting down, here now in blue, this is this is the, uh, the bifurcation curve here, hence the name swallowtail. And it gets a little harder to kind of visualize how these surfaces fold over each other. And this is where 2D or even 3D projective graphics doesn't help. You really need to play with these things. Uh, for those that have maps, I have uh, some very simple code that will plot these out and rotate them around with a Mac application called Graffer. I haven't done this in, uh, in, in Sage yet, but it would be a nice project. Uh, one behavior and four controls, butterfly, kind of not very well rendered here, but there's this complicated control surface. Again, as you're moving around in the control space, all these little curves out here means you're, the number of solutions is changing very rapidly. And then uh, this is, uh, well, we have problems visualizing this. So the elliptic umbilic catastrophe is two dimensional vector field differential equations. Uh, and three controls. So that's a five dimensional space. So here, what we're showing is just the projection down for the bifurcation surface and for getting the controls. So this is just in the 
I mean, forgetting the, the these are okay, this space, the surface are the points in the three-dimensional control space where the number of solutions changes. So I'm not plotting the behavior space, the behavior axis at all. Now the interesting thing about this classification scheme, notice down here, five controls, even with one-dimensional system, and by implication two-dimensional systems, you can show there is no finite classification. And what that means is that for these systems, a kind of generic case, this is done in kind of topological generality. In this case, as you're varying, okay, I have four appendages, so four controls and someone, someone else is sort of like another knob of the experiment, this five dimensional control space, as I'm moving around, every epsilon change in the control parameter, the number of solutions is changing, continuously changing. That's complicated. Well, I'll show you some examples where that actually occurs in the lower start looking at some chaotic systems. So, so that's just talking about bifurcations between equilibrium. So the next lecture what I'll do will be a little bit of uh, some analysis, but mostly some simulation examples to get some sense of how time-dependent behaviors, how fixed points can turn to time-dependent behavior like limit cycles, and limit cycles can change to tori and other things like that. So that's it. Any questions? No? Okay. Good. So good luck on the SAGE. And again, don't hesitate to ask questions. When you get started, it'll be a bit arbitrary. So just and work together.